common when we were out in nature with him that he'd be whistling. And he'd whistle really complicated classical music, which to the rest of us was kind of odd, but it turned out he had been quite a good classical violinist. And he whistled in tune, and if you try and whistle with him, he'd like, no, that's not it. <laughs> Go back to whistling. But you'd see him whistling a lot, you know, around camp, uh, out in the woods, by the river, whatever. So I think that was the sign that, yeah, he was, he was in his place. A lot of people would just say it's fun, uh, and, and I, I, I agree. <laughs> Skiing and, and touring especially is really fun. I think that there's a connection that we get when we're outside that our brains are kind of programmed to really appreciate. Kokanee Glacier Cabin has been around for 20 years. Prior to that, uh, there was the Slocan Chief Cabin here in the park. It's been a powder paradise for many years. In the winter weeks, groups come in and they spend a Saturday to Saturday getting typically as much powder as they can handle. <laughs> it's a place for recreating and it's also a place for education and learning more about avalanches, which is what we've been doing here this week. There's been so much history here with riders, skiers. There's also been uh, uh, its share of avalanche fatalities. And in the 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, we think that the whole movement toward more and more people getting avi savvy uh, is kind of a term that's used and, and educated around avalanches has really made a difference. And if you look at the charts of fatalities across Canada, the worst year was in 2002, 2003, peaked at 29. 18 people have died in avalanches in British Columbia, most of them in the mountains in the Nelson Revelstoke area. Last January, seven died near Revelstoke when an avalanche hit a backcountry area. And just two weeks later, seven more died, all 10th grade students from Calgary in the same general area. Ten others were injured in that avalanche. And just last week, an avalanche near Nelson trapped two truckers in their rigs, but they were able to get away without injuries. Welcome to the Cascades, one of the many natural playgrounds located within a short drive of outdoor research. The terrain here in the Pacific Northwest is varied to say the least. These different surrounding areas give outdoor research engineering and product development teams ample opportunity to develop and test products for the great outdoors. Outdoor Research, better known as OR throughout the industry, was started in 1981 here in Seattle by President Ron Gregg, who designed the first product, X Gators, in response to the lack of a functional, high-quality alternative. Since that <laughs> the, the story of outdoor research is so you know, logical that it almost seems made up, but he'd come back and sit around the dinner table complaining about everything that went wrong, and, and literally the whole family, where well, there's four kids, um, literally the whole family say, Ron, if you're so damn smart, why don't you build it yourself? And so we actually take credit for outdoor research. He <laughs> remains actively involved in all aspects of the business. Hi, welcome to my office. I'm Ron Gregg. I started this company back in 81, and at the time I had a vision that we would someday be the premier supplier of accessories to the outdoor recreation market. 
Actually, that's total bullshit. And then one day he had my sister and my mother teach him how to use a sewing machine. My name is Robert Craig, you go by Bob, and I'm Ron's brother, his little brother. He was five years older than me. I knew Ron as, as an academic, very serious, you know, very quiet, very uh, focused, I guess you would say. There was no early interest in going outdoors. <laughs> well, our outdoors was swimming and skiing. His interest in the outdoors uh, developed after he graduated from Caltech. He was working for a civil engineering firm that did large-scale projects like dams, and he was running their three-color lasers that was doing within inch accuracy over a mile distance, things like that. They sent him all over the world, and that's when he got interested in the outdoors. After the job was done, he'd stay and, and hike and start climbing, and he got more and more involved and started climbing mountains. He canceled a trip he'd been planning for quite a while. I think I, I said, I thought you were gonna be in. You know, I had to cancel it, it wasn't cold enough. He said, well, how, how the heck cold was it? He said, it was only 40 below. I can't test my stuff and only 40 below. It's gotta be colder than that. Yeah, his, uh, his, his level of intensity got certainly stronger over time. I think it was really attributed more to he needed to find extreme conditions to test his stuff to the limit. That's, that was his passion, not really, I don't think, the, the physical trip itself, that was just a, necessary piece of the process. Tim would know more. Of course, I heard a story from him on why he started the company. He was up on the Kinley. He was up there with his brother-in-law, and they got weathered in um, for about a week, and it was really, really cold. And Ron had made himself some insulated gaiters and some heavy-duty mitts, because he didn't feel like there was anything in the market that was uh, good enough for that. Uh, and so, his brother-in-law didn't have those things, and his brother-in-law lost a bunch of toes and fingers. I guess he came back from the trip kind of both highly motivated and a little angry that the industry wasn't making good gear. My name's Tim O'Neill. Been a backcountry skier, whitewater kayaker since I was in high school, really. When I met Ron, uh, probably 83, I think he had just moved out of his basement where he was cobbling together gaiters and gloves and things. I don't really think he was doing a lot of uh, focus groups on, you know, asking a whole bunch of campers, would you buy this, would you buy that? He would build something because he thought it needed to be built. He was a hell of a lot of fun to be with. And he was always willing to go do something. You know, some people talk about doing things, Ron just did them. He would show up at the University of Washington Kayak Club in the morning, we'd all try and get organized to go kayaking, and he'd just sit there on the hood of his car with his gargoyles on, leaning back, and just kind of snoozing, waiting for everybody to get their act together so we could go kayaking. And then he'd jump up and go. And he was always first one in the river and the last one off. That would have been the first times watching him. And he'd go boating with boaters like me, who then weren't any good. But he just wanted to go with people who were ready to go. And it didn't have to be a great adventure. I didn't really mention it, you know, he went to Caltech. Most people understand that's impressive in and of itself, but it was, he got a PhD in nuclear physics. And the guy was literally a genius. The depth and breadth of his knowledge, you do not want to play Trivial Pursuit with Ron. One of the things is my kids were growing up, had a question about something. One of the kids would, let's call Uncle Ron. And it just became a mantra in the family. Let's call Uncle Ron. And this isn't meant to be pejorative, but it's just, uh, he said it with a twinkle in his eye. Whenever you'd ask him a question, he would start the answer with, well, any fool knows. <laughs> Ron was fixated on the small details. And, and a lot of them were, were details that really only he thought about and that he thought were really important. And some of them made absolutely no sense to me. Now, one was that for a long time, he had a seat belt that he'd put on in his whitewater kayak because he didn't want to get knocked out of his kayak. And almost anybody else in the world would think, that's how you're gonna die. But he was so concerned about getting knocked out of his kayak. <laughs> but he... I don't think any of us thought that he would succeed or fail. Um, we just thought that, you know, he'll build something to, to his liking when he started selling, you know, the gators and it actually became an actual business. He came to me and asked me to be on his board. This is when there were, you know, two people involved, <laughs> Ron and me. I was a little surprised and shocked that, you know, how fast it was 
it was growing. And you know, he started in his, literally in his garage. The first two products that really put the company on the map were the X-Gators and, um, and the Seattle Sombrero. I mean, goodness gracious, if you heard him describe the different layers that were in the various different Saddle Sombreros, depending on whether you wanted to absorb infrared radiation or whether you wanted to radiate, <laughs> I mean, whether you wanted heat or cool, or I mean, it's just, just, just crazy. I think the first time I really remember skiing with him was I was going backcountry skiing with a group of friends. We saved my life. We were skiing around. It had been a bit of a storm the day before, some wind, some maybe a foot and a half of snow and we're going up this ridge and I see this really nice looking couloir and I go, oh, we should drop that. That looks really great. And he's like, well, just a second. Let, let me check it, I'm not sure. And so he skis out in the middle of it and there's one tree in the middle of the top of this couloir. And he skis to that tree and puts his arm around the tree and just as he does, the whole thing goes and runs, I don't know, three or 400 vertical into a deposition zone where it builds up and I was, ready to drop it, and he said, wait a minute. I don't think having uh, risk management conversations uh, as a part of protocol was happening then very much. Yeah, I think there was a lack of vernacular around uh, risk management in the backcountry, and I think that's evolved a ton over the last 30 years, and I guess that you know the accident that we were in was just one more impetus to make that evolve. Well, yeah, there, we knew there was a persistent weak layer in the snow, and we were very much uh, reticent to go uh, up high, get exposed. We were finding um, um, what I'd call kind of modest instabilities. We weren't finding anything really dramatic, even though we were de digging some really big pits. Um, so we were, we were very cognizant of that, um, but uh, you know, it turns out that things can fail in ways that you never dream of. So we're trying to piece together what might have happened on March 17th, 2003. Um, in terms of the modern era of, you know, when people were recreating, it was the, the worst year in terms of fatalities in Canada. 29 people died that year. There were a number of really significant and really big avalanches that caught people by surprise. It was just a really, really challenging snowpack. You're looking up at Slocan Chief, with, which is this big, beautiful, white expanse. It looks like it'd be great to ski, but we weren't going to go there. You know, they were in the right kind of terrain. And it, there is a certain degree of luck that comes into this. There's a certain amount of risk always in anything that we do. We started the day putting in a big pit in a place that was treed, you know, a little open place, not under the trees, obviously, but that, uh, you know, we felt real safe about. And then we looked across the valley and saw, well, there's another slope also treed. And up at the top of that, it looks like there's a little slightly more open aspect and, you know, we'd be interested in skiing up there. Let's go check it out with a pit. So I led up through the trees, breaking trail. Near the top, someone passed me and took over. So then I was at the end of the line and I came up to this bench and Scott and Jonathan had stopped right at the crest of the bench next to some trees. And I stopped for a moment and I saw that Mason, Ron and James had gone out ahead and that's, I think, where our communication failed, because we were then starting into a new domain. We were, we were getting into a, not only an elevation, but an aspect that we weren't familiar with. And we should have stopped right there and, and come up with a, a risk management plan. But they were all having a conversation and just trucking along. It was beautiful and there was nice snow. I stopped and I, I just had a bad sense and kind of, I, Normally I would just like go on right behind them, but I'm looking around and I couldn't articulate it. It wasn't clear to me. And I just watched for maybe 10 seconds and then all of a sudden, bang. The avalanche started. First, the little slope we were on, uh, which had trees on the left and a cliff up on the right, wasn't that steep, wasn't that big. 
but it's woofed, it's settled, and it slid down into the trees on the left. And that was maybe a burial of a foot to 18 inches, no big deal. And I'm thinking, okay, we got this, you know, John, Jonathan and Scott jump and, you know, we're yelling, go into, go into um, search mode. And then the um, slope that woofed under us and slid caused the crack basically to propagate out to a huge slope way out in front of us in the distance. And that let loose really deep, really big. And then another like crack, it sounded like artillery shells to me from up above the cliff. There was a much larger slope up there and that let go a uh, two meter fracture face. And that slid down um, through the, over the cliff, through trees, breaking some reasonably good sized trees off in the process um, and came over the cliff. And now our friends who had been buried in a foot, maybe two at most, were now buried kind of six to 12 feet deep, you know? And, and not only that, but, but buried up against a tree dam. So usually, you know, if you, if you have a slide that's on a, that stops on a slope, you can dig in from the bottom and get there a lot more quickly. When it's up against a dam like that, you have to dig straight down. And so uh, fortunately, Mason was able to turn on his skis when the slope first started going, and he headed for a tree that was sloping downhill and he got pushed part way up it by the first slide. The next slide came down, pushed him further up it, but also compressed his lungs and made him black out. But his face was above the snow and he, so then he came back too. But uh, James and Ron were not so lucky. I mean, when it's, when the slope first started kind of fluidizing, kind of, they just lost their balance and fell flat and then got buried and then got buried again. We had the old fashioned beacons, which you know, they, they couldn't isolate on one, one beacon or another. They weren't digital, they're were analog. You traverse the slope, get to the loudest point, and then as it would get weaker, you go back to that loudest point, turn down the sensitivity, and you know, turn down slope at that point and do it again and again and again. So we got over uh, what turned out to be Ron pretty fast, less, maybe a minute but I couldn't figure it out because I turned my beacon down to, when I always, when I'd done beacon practice in the past, you know, you keep turning it down, down and down. So I'd get over the loudest point and I'd turn it down and I'd lose it. I, was like, I couldn't figure that out. And that was because, you know, he was three meters under the snow. He started digging straight down, but then we realized, whoa, we, there's two people buried. So Jonathan went and found James and I jumped over and started digging there. And, uh, and Mason had got himself free, and so Mason and Scott kept digging down to get to Ron. And uh, I think we got to Ron in 40 minutes. We got to James in 30. And it was a compression kind of uh, situation up against that tree dam, so none of them had snow in their mouth. So they were clearly never got a breath. Even if all of us would have been on one of them immediately, I don't think we could have gotten there in time. It was just too much snow to move. Anyway, the, the Abbey crew from the BC highways came in in their helicopter. And, and first thing they did was drop bombs all the way around the cirque up above it. Just bomb the hell out of that place before they'd go in. The huge, beautiful slope that we wanted to ski didn't even move, despite all the bombs. So if we'd just been jackasses and gone skied that, we'd been okay. Control people said, well, this is the kind of slide that could have got us too. I guess it made us feel that we weren't complete jackasses, but you know, you, you live with what ifs forever after that. Which of the four of us, I think it was just in conversation, we, we said, we gotta go back there. We gotta, you know, kind of go consecrate the, the space. And so that's what we did. We had 
another level of closure, I guess. Two hundred employees are stunned by his death. He seemed invincible, but his family says with a life full of risk and adventure, they knew one day they'd get the call they've been dreading. And the super irony is that he was killed uh, a shoot on the other side of a ridge that had 200-year-old trees on it. So there hadn't been an avalanche across that ridge in 200 years. So, yeah, no, we, we were expecting it, but not on that trip we weren't. I stepped in to run the company. Ron had been considering selling even before the accident. And there were actually a couple of suitors out there that we were talking to, and I was involved uh, with various meetings with various potential acquirers. Um, it wasn't very long after um, Ron's death that uh, Dan called me. I met Dan, I think, within days or weeks of Ron's death. And I think he and I kind of knew from our first meeting that we were going to put a deal together. Called around a couple friends I had in the industry, uh, and and just checked in like you know because I I hadn't been close to it at all. I'm Dan Nordstrom and I'm largely retired though I still hang around the board of outdoor research. And I asked you know where does outdoor research stand in the in the mind of sort of the industry players at that time, uh, and you know the word was that outdoor research was was struggling but everyone was rooting for them because they were they had always sort of done the right things and hadn't really made anybody mad by doing the wrong things so they were kind of rooting for OR and I really found that to be the case as I stepped in people were hopeful that OR was going to come back but because Ron had been very committed to domestic production building largely everything in Seattle and yet he didn't have the capital to really sort of do it in the modern way so Essentially, OR was in a squeeze where uh, sales weren't growing, costs were rising, they weren't at the forefront of technology, and you know they were kind of in a dead end. And, and that was, but at the same time, there was a brand that people knew something about. And so I felt like it, we had a chance to sort of turn that around. I'd sat on the board for 20 years. I, I knew the product line. I knew you know I knew the operation, but you know I I, I certainly I knew I also didn't have the passion for invention and design and and I wasn't the guy to advance the company I could uh, manage the company keep it keep it going and um, uh, I I assumed that we would close the sale even before Dan called me and when Dan called it just expedited everything the thing it's hard it's hard to visualize now is that the whole outdoor industry kind of got created you know, late 60s and the 70s. And for the most part, the product was really not very good. So people hadn't learned how to make things well. And, and you know, in the 70s, as I was coming up as a climber, buying a frost line kit and making it yourself from parts was a legitimate alternative to buying a finished product because the finished products just, you know, weren't that good. And so the whole industry was so at such an in its infancy in the 80s um, that, and it was very small. And things were sold through, you know, small ads in the back of Climbing Magazine, and it was it was kind of a small little cult world uh, of people that went off and did these odd sports like, you know, ski mountaineering and rock climbing. Um, and so it's just very nichey, really, quite frankly. And then in the '90s, uh, offshore production came up, and these companies started to get much bigger, much more quickly. And direct marketing had come out at the same time. REI was really growing fast. And, and, and the, the product set and frankly the activities went from this very small niche to a much more mainstream uh, experience and, and, and the, the whole marketplace just really took off in the 90s. And I think outdoor research, Ron, Greg, wasn't really prepared to, to chase that, whereas North Face and Patagonia and some others had enough scale to where they had some real business people in there and they were able to hit the gas and, and really ride the 90s uh, boom much more effectively than OR. And that's where OR sort of got off the back and was, was in a, a tough place when I showed up. Dan clearly was from Seattle, wanted to stay in Seattle, wanted the company intact and keeping, keeping
keeping the employees. I'm not sure this is an accurate statement, but I wouldn't be surprised if Ron didn't know the names of every employee. And uh, if not everyone, certainly a huge majority of them. And uh, he wasn't known as a great delegator <laughs> in terms of design. Um, and he bucked everybody's, you know, input about fashion. He, he hated fashion. I mean, he was on the floor, every floor. When he wasn't out traveling, he was, he was here and walking around. Quality was his passion. And to, to get the quality he wanted, I mean, he, was, he was around watching it being built, figuring out how to do it better, not necessarily faster better. I was really the antithesis of Ron. You know, I wasn't going to invent a product and uh, I was going to rely on building a team and having the team do that. I walked in, I've now bought the company and there's Ron's desk and Ron had this big desk in a big room and you know, he had a stereo there and all kinds of his personal effects and you know, he had left on vacation and uh, they hadn't done anything with the desk. So all of his Stuff was there, his files, his personal knickknacks and all that. And I had to, and no one wanted to touch it. So I had to kind of go through this process of sort of sorting through all of Ron's things. And that was really the beginning of this, you know, pretty long process of me learning about Ron through stories from everybody telling me about Ron. And there was, you know, it was fascinating because there was all the things that they loved about Ron, that he stood for and that were the core OR. And then there were all the things that Ron frustrated everybody with. And uh, there was a lot of, you know, we always thought we should do it this way, but Ron always said no. And because I didn't really know the business personally very well, I, my reaction was, well, what if we try your way? And they're like, really, we could do that? And like, yeah, let's try that. And so we pretty quickly started to do things differently than Ron had done it. And I think the team became really excited by that. And so we, we, we quickly started to transition and started to grow again. Yeah, I mean, as, as intelligent and potentially complex as Ron was, he, he was also very simple, you know, just my way. <laughs> and he was designing stuff and said, well, it'd be, you know, people would like, he said, I don't care what they'd like. I'm building this because that's the way it should be. He had a very focused um, opinion on uh, how he wanted it to be. And if other people didn't want that, he didn't care. And, and because he didn't just design them, he used them and he tweaked them because, you know, they, he, he was as hard on himself as he was anybody in terms of if that didn't work, you know, what a piece of shit, you know, you, know, you gotta fix that, that just, that's no good. I can't, I can't live with that. Um, and he tried different materials and different solutions. And uh, I mean, again, his science, background and actually measuring the results, you know, testing the results um, until he got it the way he wanted it. I would say Ron was, was a work in progress when he died. I think he was, uh, he knew who he was in a business sense, he knew who he was in an outdoor sense, but I think he was finally starting to kind of soften up a little bit and be more emotionally available. But that was starting to, to take root and I remember talking to him about that and thinking, okay, there's a light here, this, this could happen. So I was pretty sad not to see that play out. He was very self-defined and you, know, you could tell in the way he dressed and the way he acted that he was, you know, first and foremost, he was himself. And uh, that you, know, you, know, you need to pay attention to the world and other people, but you also need to not cave in and not be yourself. What, what do they call it? A you know, AAA personality? Yeah, he, he, he was in charge of his life. And, and again, I don't necessarily care what other people wanted to do. This is what we're gonna do. If you wanna come, that'd be great. Love to have you. But we're gonna do it. This is what we're gonna do. Which is why I kind of stopped going on trips with him. <laughs> I'm quite sure he uh, was concerned about the well-being of his employees. You know, he was kind of a three P's guy. You know, people, planet, profit. You know, today we've got 240 people here working in Seattle, making what we all like to think are pretty much the premier accessories for outdoor recreation in the, uh, the market. I believe uh, he would want to have continued to make 
gear that um, outperformed, that filled the niches that weren't being properly filled in his mind. A lot of the things we did, like kitchen kits and travel kits, uh, didn't even exist uh, before we came up with them. But you know now they're sort of standard products in the market, and you see copies of most of that stuff everywhere. He wanted people to go out in nature and have a good time. And one of his one of his many sayings was, "There's no such thing as bad weather. There's just inadequate clothing." So the four mantras that are core to the philosophy of outdoor research, if we can be said to have a philosophy, are to build products that are innovative, versatile, durable, and provide the consumer with good value. So to do this, we've spent a lot of effort over the years to find materials that are the best, to make sure that we're getting out into the, the big office and testing things you know, day in and day out to make sure they really work. What's been really uh exciting and compelling for me after all these years is to see that the, the historic commitment to the product that Ron brought and then we built a team that's been able to carry forward um, is, is truly authentic. You weren't going to talk him out of anything, so it didn't make it any easier, but you know, it's, it is what it is. He lived his life the way he wanted to live it and he died doing what he wanted to do. Any fool would. <laughs> When someone who doesn't know the backcountry, or skiing, or whitewater kayaking for that matter, and they, they hear that you do it, and they think that you're taking these huge risks, um, I, I tell them that um, I feel like the riskiest thing I do on a regular basis is ride my bike to work in Seattle. I'm regularly exposed to some jackass with her phone, right? out and not paying attention and had plenty of close calls. Um, I'm at risk for getting cancer. I'm at risk for any number of things. And I think we're all at risk for having a life that's not very meaningful, that doesn't really bring us joy, that doesn't connect us to something bigger than ourselves. And uh, that's kind of the biggest risk of all. Still, a lot of people are, are really run by their fears. You know, they, they fear um, what could happen much more than they, they fear not having the experience. And Ron was quite the opposite. Ron wasn't ever going to live without having the experiences. So he would not have held back. You know, if, we, if he had not been the one to die, if it had been you know, one of us instead, he would have kept going, no doubt. You can't drive risk to zero in anything. And you see people who aren't active and their risk is, you know, hypertension, diabetes, <laughs> all the things that come with not being physically vital. You know, you clear data on people who are in poor physical condition, not, and or stressed. You know, they have a lot of stress in their life. They don't have a way to get their stress out. I mean, those things are life shortening. There's, so I'll, uh, I'll take my chances in the woods.